Good morning, everyone. All right, so let's get started. The question that we had was a one false one dimensional NMR experiment. Basically, what we were trying to understand here, what will be the influence of T1 relaxation and the overall recycle delay that is given in the D1, interscan delay D1 and the acquisition time AQ. What will be the equation that we'll be using? This is the equation that we use. This is the equation for longitudinal relaxation for a demagnetization that has been generated from nuclear spins. This is from our block equations. So after you apply a 90 degree pulse, there is nothing along the z-axis. So the mz of naught will become zero. So therefore you're gonna have mz of t will be equal to m naught one minus e power minus t by t one. This is the equation that governs how relaxation happens. Since we are talking about percentages with respect to the bulk magnetization, what we want to do is to take mz of t divided by m naught will be one minus e minus t by t one. So then we had two cases that had been written out. The case one where d1 plus aq was one second plus 0.5 seconds. So the overall interscan, I mean, relaxation delay is 1.5 seconds. That's what we had uh, planned to determine. And for the same problem, we also said that t1 times is 0.5 seconds. We said T2 is 0.1 second, that does not matter. We are trying to look for longitudinal magnetization. Then the reason why I gave you T2 is to see whether how many of you apply T2 in the equation. Okay, so don't be confused. When you're talking about longitudinal relaxation, you only invoke T1, not T2, right? So therefore, this entire equation becomes mz of T over m naught will be equal to one minus e power 1.5 because this happens to be the T and then T1 is 0.5 with the negative sign. So this is going to be 1 minus E power minus 3. 1 minus 0 0.0497, which is approximately equal to 0.95, indicating 95% of M0 recovers after the D1 plus AQ for a given condition of T1 of 0.5 seconds. So similarly, the next case that we wanted to invoke Everything remained same except for the fact that the T1 was changed fr from, uh, I think it was changed to one second, from 0.5 seconds to one second. So the entire equation, therefore, you don't have to change much. MZ, we are still talking about the 90 degree following a 90 degree excitation, which will be 1 minus E per minus 1.5. That will be 0.221. So in this case, you are able to realize this is about 78%. What are we trying to do here is that we are asking for the same single pulse 90 degree experiment. How does the longitudinal magnetization recover for a given set of parameters? This is not a surprise to you because if the T1 time doubles or rather uh, is actually, if the T1 time increases, it's not a surprise that the recovery that happens for a given amount of time which is given as D1 plus AQ is rather lesser. So systems that have longer and longer T1 require a longer and longer D1 plus AQ. Slowly you realize for large systems, AQ is not going to be appreciable, while D1 is the one that's a major factor. So generally people only talk about D1 delay as recycle delay or relaxation delay, but D1 plus AQ technically forms the relaxation delay. So now let's do the same exercise. I want you guys to take the next two minutes. Instead of keeping the alpha to 90 degrees, do it for an alpha of 30 degrees. And repeat your process for cases of A, T1 being 0.5 seconds, for case B being T1 being 1 second. Literally repeat for the same, but the only difference here would be that instead of applying a 90 degree pulse, you apply a 30 degree pulse. Let's see what comes up. What did you find? What is the equation that you use? Again? C S uh, half M Z of zero, right? M Z of T will be given by M naught minus the whole bracket M naught minus M Z of zero. That will be why? Okay, so therefore why? 
how much will it be along z so it should be cos of 30 degrees not sin you are not asking what is on the transverse plane you are asking what is on the longitudinal axis so square root of 3 by 2 or n not e power minus t over t1 what you have here is that mz of t or m not therefore will become 1 minus 2 minus square root of 3 by 2 times e power minus t by t1 so this will be 1 minus 0.134 e power minus t by t1 is that right so therefore for the case a <coughs> mz over m not equal to 1 minus mz 1 minus 0.134 e power minus t by t1 remember what did we set as t for this 1.5 divided by 0.5 so basically this translates itself to be e power minus 3 So this is one minus zero point zero zero six seven. This is overall going to be ninety nine point three percent. And for case B, m z or m not will be one minus point one three four e power minus one point five, which is going to be equal to ninety seven point zero percent, ninety seven percent. So what you are able to realize here is that. irrespective of the value of t1 you are able to appreciate that the magnetization recovers very close to thermal equilibrium although the t1s are vastly different so this i hope emphasizes the fact that you are able to run an experiment at a lower flip angle such that the recovery of magnetization is very close to thermal equilibrium across spins of different t1s given a set of d1 plus aq being reasonably set Right, so therefore, a thirty degree pulse, which only gives half the sensitivity of what a ninety degree pulse would give, that's okay, largely because the recovery happens way close to the thermal equilibrium, which allows for a steady state that's very close. On the other hand, the previous situation, if you saw, you had the disparity of about twenty percent difference between these two. So let's say that these two spins exist within the same sample. You acquired the NMR experiment for them together. when you end up integrating there will be a 20% error that comes up do you see that right so what did we say what how do we translate it to error in this i'm just giving an example don't take it seriously let's say that the 0.5 seconds was with respect to the metal and 1 second is with respect to the methylene within the same sample you had different t1s you run an experiment for a given molecule giving a certain set of parameters and you are able to realize that if the t1 values are vastly different depending upon the combination of d1 plus aq which is a recycle delay that you have given relaxation delay that you have given the recovery might not be uniform so what you are able to see yeah the 90 degree pulse is quite the most sensitive but might not be the most appropriate given the fact that we do not know the t1s across different systems and therefore when you end up integrating although you will get chemical shifts properly you will get scalar couplings properly you realize that this uh, integration will fail which is one of the important steps now we just did everything for a single scan let's do the same thing for a two scan experiment if you realized for a single scan or a multi scan experiment the initial magnetization is going to keep changing if you end up doing a 90 degree pulse you will always put the mz of 0 to 0 right so you are going to keep on having the same equation which ends up having a similar type of recovery that's going to be present yes uh, i don't understand how the how basically the how much the magnetization is recovered uh, that it correlates to the uh, yeah i can explain that again do you agree that each one of them have their own specific bulk magnetization that comes up because of the alpha beta spins and since they have a population difference you have a magnetization for alpha and beta which interfere and therefore given m not for each right and that's for a single spin we create an m not if there are three equivalent spins you are going to get three m not for this and two m not for this and one m not for this why one because there is only one proton why two because there are two equivalent protons why three because there are three equivalent protons do you agree on this right now if you want to make nmr quantitative such that after you get the spectrum and you integrate the uh, proton peaks you have to make sure this is established now, where do you get the 3 to 1 1 it's coming from the initial bulk magnetization 
correct? Now, what you're able to see is that take this for the methyl and take this for the methylene, instead of having 3M0, or rather, let's assume it's a single spin system, HA and HB are being present, which don't have scalar coupling, don't complicate your life. Two protons are there within the same molecule. Uh, let me take an example. So you can imagine an example like CH3COO, uh, CH3, for instance. These two protons are different. They have the same number of protons, three protons each, so we can keep the three out. Both have their own M0. For whatever reason, let's assume that one of the proton has a T1 time of 0.5, the other has one, one, one second. That's the example that we are assuming here. Right? You are able to catch up with the example thus far. Now, what has happened, instead of having M0 and M0, as you repeat the experiments, it's 0.95 M0 and 0.78 M0. Although it should be 1 and 1. If it's 0 0.78 and 0 0.78, things would have been okay. If it's 0 0.95 and 0.95, it would have been okay. Do you see a disparity between them? You initially started with them being equal, but after your perturbation, you're not allowing them to recover back to their own equilibrium. You can't wait for that long. You'll waste a lot of time. So therefore, you just want to get spectrum fast enough. So therefore, you start cutting time here and there. I'm just giving you an example. If you're taking a certain combination of cutting time, what is the overall influence on the bulk magnetization? Therefore, if the bulk magnetization is not established close to its equilibrium, what are the consequences you pay for it? Let us say you have no other option. You have to keep a very short D1 plus AQ given the T1 times. Then you won't integrate that spectrum. This is why I said long back, carbon spectra are seldom integrated to get the number of carbons that are being present. Because the T1 times are vastly different across them. Right, and we do a 30 degree pulse experiment that also won't recover it completely. Put instead of doing this uh, part, try to put five seconds as the T1 time and put the overall D1 plus AQ still at 1.5. You will see the disparity. Things start to become more and more unequal as you start to increase T1, which is what is the case for biomolecules. So, the point that I would like to emphasize here across the range of T1 times that are present for proton spins or anyway, nuclear spins within your molecule, the D1 plus AQ allows it to recover to different extents. Slowly, you will realize that this aspect becomes more and more, the recovery becomes less and less. This is where the dummy scans come into play. So maybe the exercise for today would be repeat this. This is a one scan experiment. Repeat this for multi-scan experiment. Given that these numbers recover quite close to equilibrium, you would realize that this guys will be around 95, 90%. They'll keep on coming. That's the steady state we established. But on the other hand, something like this would keep suffering. Something like a 78% M0. In the next scan, it'll be 70%. After the next scan, it'll be 68%. Then maybe it'll saturate at 67%. That's, that's, that's the purpose of the dummy scans. You do enough dummy scans to make sure it reaches a steady state of 67%, whatever it is. So if we use a shorter flip angle, you have the ability to still reach reasonable equilibria across T1 spins. So for the first few scans, it'll reduce drastically. But after that, it'll taper off. It'll be in the last decimal in the percentage. That wouldn't matter. That'll be within the noise level. Anything less than a person don't care. That's when you say you reached a steady state. Right? So the purpose of the dummy scans where you repeat is to allow for a steady state to come up. The steady state matters because across scans, remember you are doing a signal averaging. What I'm trying to say is that the integrals will suffer. The sensitivity will suffer. Chemical shift will not suffer. Chemical shift can be reliably measured for all this, even if you don't set it up properly. Scalar coupling to a reasonable extent can be done, provided you set up the shimming and all that okay. You will see why these things matter. I've been repeatedly telling carbon has a long T1, isn't it? Slowly, I have biased you guys to think that doing a direct carbon experiment is not sensible. If you have a long T1 to get this data is going to be way slower. Secondly, it's weighted by the garamagnetic ratio, in which case carbon is lower. And I have also shown you before the mid-sim that you can take use the proton to get the carbon. Right? So slowly we are marching towards experiments where the insensitive nuclei is always leveraged out with the more sensitive nuclei. That's biomolecular remark, more or less. So I'm just setting the stage up to make you guys understand how these parameters are very important to get a good NMR spectrum and how would they end up affecting it. Any, uh, basically, we're trying to understand why do you have different scans? Why do you have dummy scans? Why do you have to do signal averaging? Signal averaging is direct because you have no sensitivity, you want to improve your sensitivity. 
That's obvious, right? But on the other hand, why do you have dummy scans? I hope it's a little more clear. You do a few dummies so that it reaches a steady state, then you can start. So that at least within the scans you're acquiring, the fidelity is higher. The next thing that we would like to discuss with, uh, with respect to experimental setup is a few more things. So let's go to the free induction decay. I've been drawing something like this forever. And you guys are okay with this because you are able to realize whatever we are drawing here is the real part of signal that looks like this, correct? Why did I say real part? There is a real and complex part. For every part of the signal, there's going to be something that's orthogonal, the real and imaginary parts that you're imagining, right? So it has to have a zero crossing here. Whenever there's a maximum, there's a minimum. So whenever there's a zero crossing, there should be a maximum. Something of this sort. Yeah? They're just phase shifted with respect to each other. This is the imaginary part of the signal. And this is the real part of the signal. And we get a complex signal, which is a combination of the real and imaginary part. I cannot draw this. This is in three dimensions. It's actually a helix. If you just take this part and draw it, you have the cos part, you have the sine part. Actually, the signal will be a helix that comes up. You have to draw it in three dimensions, right? So that's where I can draw this easily. And of course, the relaxation part comes up as a decay that's present. Therefore, you have a combination of oscillation and a relaxation decay. This is the free induction decay that we have been looking at. Although we keep drawing it as a continuous signal, in reality, we do not measure it continuously. We digitize the signal, meaning that for every few intervals, specific intervals of time, you ask, okay, tell me what is the signal that's being present. So what do I mean by this is that instead of getting all the points, you get only a few set of points. So therefore, we have been telling repeatedly that we do Fourier transformation. We don't do Fourier transformation. We do something close to discrete Fourier transformation. What is the difference between Fourier transformation and discrete Fourier transformation? Fourier transformation works on functions, which are continuous, or meaning that you have all the points that are being present. Discrete Fourier transformation works on some set of data points that are there, and then will convert it to a frequency domain, discrete frequency domain spectrum. Yeah? You don't have to worry too much about it, but all it matters to know is that you measure a certain number of points. And in previous lecture, we said we set the total acquisition time to AQ based on T2 times, right? So therefore, the total number of points that is generally corrected, let's, let's say the total acquisition time is AQ. The total number of points that's collected is NP. Okay, let me write that name clearly because the first time I'm using number of points, okay? Many times it's used as total number of points. What do we mean by it? You have real points, you have imaginary points. So generally they are equally distributed. Number of real and imaginary points should be same, all right? So therefore, kind of, uh, if you have a total acquisition time of AQ and NP number of points are used, NP by two number of real points are used, are measured, right? So can people tell me what is the, can we find the duration between points? How would we do it? Yeah, so basically that is called the dwell time. So that's going to be given by the total duration divided by the total number of points that are present. Is that right? I hope I wrote it correctly. Yeah, I think this should be right, yeah? Now, is, uh, then this parameter, which I wrote, is called dwell time, meaning the duration the, between the points that are being acquired is called dwell time, meaning that the duration between these two points, they'll all be equally set. We will see an example in a few moments from here on. Okay? And for reasons that I can't go into serious details into, this dwell time is inversely proportional to the spectral width. This is based on something called Nyquist sampling. 
there's a theorem that comes where it says if you want to capture an event at a certain frequency, you have to capture at least at twice the frequency of what, what's happening. For instance, there are times where you guys are sleeping in a bedroom looking at the fan. Although you know for a fact that the fan is rotating clockwise, it will appear counterclockwise. That's because the refresh rate of your eyes are not as fast as the rate at which the fan is uh, rotating. The same matter, these lights are actually flickering. Do you see them flicker? Because you don't refresh as fast as the flicker rate. You take a camera or your phone and do this, then you slowly see the flickering happening. That's because the camera is opening and closing and therefore it's able to catch up. Right? So I, if I, I have to go to the Nyquist sampling, it'll take a long time to explain what's happening, but just take it from me. Sometimes you can just borrow ideas from other established fields. That's what I'm doing right now. This is all very well established in a field called digital signal processing, which engineers obsess about so as to make sure we can use our mobile phones all the time. Just as an example. Right? So there, yet again, the dwell time, which is a parameter of the free induction decay that we are acquiring, is directly related to the, or inversely related to the spectral width. So the dwell time is going to be given by one over spectral width. For people who are getting confused between spectral width and bandwidth, that's the other width that I had ex explained before, correct? Bandwidth and spectral width are different parameters. Bandwidth is with respect to a pulse. So don't confuse it. While spectral width is related to the spectrum. What do we mean by this? We were talking about chemical shifts that come in different portions. Generally, proton NMR spectrum spans 0 to, say, 15 ppm. Yeah? So if you want to effectively acquire a proton spectrum across molecules, just as an example, I keep the carrier position at 7.5 ppm and keep a spectral width of 15 ppm. I will interchange spectral width in ppm and in hertz. Okay? Hertz will come based on the B dot. I'm giving ppm as an number that's common across spectrometer fields. That, that's why the PPM scale came, isn't it? PPM scale came because then you can talk about chemical shifts independent of fields. So I'll talk about in PPM and I'll switch to Hertz in a few moments. If you say that all your resonances should fall within 0 to 15 PPM, how did we find this? This is through experience. People have collected enough data to know, okay, most of them fall within this. If most of them fall within this, then if you keep the carrier here, then if you keep a spectral width of 15 BPM, you see that 7.5 plus minus 7.5 comes up. So effectively you span zero to 7, uh, 15 BPM. Does that make sense? So in some ways, the 7.5 BPM that you keep is the carrier position. And what is the carrier position equivalent? We are talking about the omega RF that you're trying to set on top of the B naught that's being applied. So now let's go to Hertz. If you're trying to say the omega naught is 500 megahertz, the omega RFT for such an experiment will be 500 megahertz plus 7.5 ppm, which is 7.5 times 500. Remember, 7.5 times 500 is T750, right? Hertz. So it's 500 megahertz plus 4000, or rather, let me put the right number, 3750 hertz. You see that this is in megahertz, this is in hertz. So this is going to be coming in several decimals away from it. So that's the omega RF that you're trying to put. And depending upon the duration, remember the bandwidth, what was the bandwidth that we are talking about? Generally, we were talking about 25 kilohertz pulse for a 10 microsecond long pulse. You remember this, right? So 25 kilohertz on a 500 megahertz translates itself to, so the bandwidth of excitation is 50 ppm for a pulse that's characterized by 25 kilohertz. Okay. Therefore, if you keep it at 7.5 ppm, it'll go plus minus 25 ppm for the excitation. So what's an excitation? The perturbation you felt plus minus 25 ppm from your carrier, but you choose to see only between uh, uh, 0 to 15 ppm. So spectral width is what you choose to see. Bandwidth is to make sure you get an uniform excitation. 
bandwidth is to make sure that you apply and all spins are treated as equally as you could. So therefore you apply a hard pulse so that everybody gets the same level of perturbation. So that everybody gets close to a 90 degree pulse, not a 80 degree, 70 degree and 60 degree as you go farther away. Yeah. So be a little careful. There's a difference between bandwidth and spectral width. Spectral width is what you choose to see. Bandwidth is how much you want to excite. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> we were trying to talk about the free induction decay where you are able to see here that the dwell time, which is the duration between the data points that's acquired in an FID is taken care by the spectral width. Right? So let me, let's continue doing it for a bandwidth of something like this. The experiment that we are trying to do is 15 ppm in spectral width. 15 ppm in spectral width is what? 15 times 500, which is 7,500 hertz. So spectral width, for 15 ppm on a 500 megahertz is 7,500 hertz. Okay? Yes? So therefore, the dwell time is going to be 1 over 7,500 seconds. So that comes to 1.33 milliseconds. Meaning that for the entire acquisition time that you set up, now it doesn't matter. Remember this. The dwell time is set to something like 1.33 seconds. In one of the example, we took acquisition time as 500 milliseconds or 0.5 seconds. So for every 0.5 seconds, sorry, within this 0.5 seconds, for every 1.33 milliseconds, you will acquire a data point. One of the most important parameters I would like to define to you right now. Resolution. Resolution is inversely proportional to acquisition time. So what does this mean? As you acquire longer and longer, you get better and better resolution. This number being low is good for you. So what does this mean? This is basically trying to give you an idea how easily can you distinguish two closely uh, present points. Resolution is defined by that, right? If you have two points, what is your ability to distinguish them in the shortest of distances? So the lower the number, Increase in, indicates a higher resolution. Lower magnitude of resolution indicates a high resolution spectrum. So please be a little careful about it. This is not surprising yet again, because let's say you have two very close frequencies. Let's say three and 3.5 Hertz. Let's say three is the blue, 3.5 Hertz is the red, sorry, green. These are the two different frequencies. You'll realize that initially as you start, 3 and 3.5 will be very close, but as the time goes on, they'll distinguish each other. I think I did the opposite. Isn't it? That's how frequency works. You'll be able to distinguish frequencies only over a period of time if the frequencies are really close. So that makes total sense. The acquisition time, if it's longer and longer, it'll have the ability to distinguish very close frequencies. Okay, slowly I have made you guys Think about this acquisition time. What did we say? We set acquisition time to three times T2. So it's a molecular property that sets it. If your T2 is short, AQ is short. If AQ is short, resolution is less. Do you see this? So it's kind of a thing you, the, if you want a higher resolution, then you should keep longer AQ. But if you keep longer AQ, your sensitivity will take a hit. So this is a classic spectroscopic problem that exists across all spectroscopies that the kind of, this is a vague statement I'm making, don't take it literally, the product of sensitivity to resolution is kind of a constant. What do I mean by this? If you have a very highly sensitive technique, the resolution that you get will be not as high. On the other hand, a technique that has a very high resolution will suffer in sensitivity. It's very interesting, isn't it? Take fluorescence for instance. It has a super high sensitivity. It can see a single molecule. That's the power of fluorescence. But at the, when you see a single molecule, at that time, you're not talking about atoms. You're talking about the entire protein or entire, entire big thing that you're looking at. You cannot say whether it's coming from the top portion, bottom portion. Maybe you can change the fluor fluorescing pair to help you distinguish this, but you got to do many more experiments. On the other hand, NMR doesn't need any such complications. It can give you super high resolution. Every atom speaks to you. But of course, the problem comes from sensitivity. And therefore, your molecule already predetermines what is the maximum resolution you could get. Isn't it? 
because the T2 times this this decides what is the acquisition time. The acquisition time decides the resolution that you could get. So basically, you all, all these are theoretical limits that are posed by the technique itself. I think I defined most of it. The rest, whatever I didn't define, we can see the instrument and start seeing it. As I said, we are going towards the practical applicability. The parameters that we have learned is dummy scans, number of scans, D1 delay. One of the points that I didn't mention is that, I'm sorry, I said I'll talk about broker terminology and then I suddenly switch to uh, variant, which I got trained in. So this will be called TV, not MP. Uh, I think total number of data points or something like that. Okay. Uh, so the TD always refers to total number of data points, real and imaginary. So this will be TD by two. Okay. These are just basic terminologies. So I'm going to show you guys a little bit of the spectrum and see how these things manifest and see whether these values are indeed true. I hope my screen is visible now. So uh, this is the software that I've been trying to refer to you guys. Uh, I'm not trying to do any advertisement for Broker here since that's one of the major manufacturer of NMR instruments and trying to use that. That's what is available in ISER, Bhopal, Pune and Trivandrum. So uh, don't take it as an advertisement for uh, the instrument, but just giving you an idea of uh, how the spectrum would work. Okay. I'm not being paid for it or anything. So let's take a molecule that I like. I We have acquired it for different molecules. Let's take ethanol. So this is the proton one dimension NMR spectrum. So uh, let me try to show you the FID first. So this is the free induction decay. And if you see to the bottom portion, you see that this is a total amount of time the data is acquired. And if you see, we have acquired it to a tune of about th three odd seconds. So you type AQ and hit enter you're able to see how long you acquired it. We have acquired it for 3.27 seconds. You guys see that? So that's how far the free induction decay is going. Okay. Then you would say, hey, what's happening? If you zoom in, are you guys able to see the frequencies that are being present? Right? So that's what, although you don't see a signal directly, you will see something that's happening. We are still truncating the signal, meaning that we could have gone farther to get even high resolution for ethanol. This is the point here. Okay, so majority of the signal died within one second. That's not surprising to us because go back and look at the block equation e power minus t by t2. You'll realize that 60% dies within 2t2 or something, right? Even, even faster, actually. So if I go zoom in, this is how the FID looks. We nicely draw frequencies, but remember... This is a sum of three different frequencies of the methyl proton, of the methylene proton, and the hydroxyl proton, if present. So you're not going to see a nice frequency distribution that comes in. I'll try to take a simpler molecule to see whether we can see a nice frequency and pick up. How do you pick up a frequency? Cycles per second. So if you pick up a wavelength, you, you would be able to determine what's the frequency, and therefore, you'll be able to see what's going on. All that is the same. But you don't see something smooth and nice here, largely because the points are also digitized. Yeah, show data points. The moment I say show data points and apply, you soon see the FID has a red, uh, sorry, blue points that are being present. Do you guys see that? And they are all at a specific distribution. Let me measure the duration between these two points. Not sure how many of you are able to see, this comes up to be 49, I mean, about 50 microseconds. Do you see that? The duration between two data points is 50 microseconds. If I tell you the dwell time is 50 microseconds, can you guys tell me what is the spectral width? One or 50 microseconds, isn't it? Good. What is it? So let's try to ask whether that is indeed the case. Probably it'll be 10. There you go, 10 kilohertz. This is because of twice the number of sampling that we do. So that's exactly what we end up doing in direct dimension. We take twice the number of points, take half of the points to make them imaginary. I'll come to this during the hardware part. Okay. Yeah. So with that being the case, this is the spectrum that we ended up getting. So this is the FID and the full FID still looks the same. Then you can type a command to get do the Fourier transformation and you end up getting a spectrum that looks like this. Here you see that you acquired a spectrum that's a combination of absorptive and dispersive phase. So you go to that just phase and then you can change it as an angle and you can change it any which way that you want. 
So we have made the spectrum absorptive right now. And how many signals did you expect for ethanol? Three. This has been something I've been telling from the beginning. Do you see three NMR signals? Yes. And at the same time, what do you see as the multiplicity? This is for the hydroxyl proton. You see a broad resonance that's being present. And the CH2 will be a quartet because it's coupled to a CH3. And the CH3 will be a triplet because it's coupled to a CH2. Right? And this is an experiment that's run so well that if you carefully pay attention to the integrals, they nicely come as 1 to 1.5. Methylene to methyl is 1 to 1.5, isn't it? 2 to 3. If 2 is set to 1, 3 is goes to 1.5. So that's the quantitative nature of NMR. And the most important aspect here, so this is the discrete NMR. We end up seeing continuous signals. So I'll go back and say settings and don't share data points. Then it'll end up nicely joining things together. So then what are the other things that we'd like to measure? We like to measure the scalar coupling. Let's see the scalar coupling. Can people read what is the scalar coupling? About 7 hertz, this is from the methylene. So let me do the same exercise for methyl. What do you predict it should be? Should also be 7 hertz. They're talking with each other. There you go. Right? So you're able to see that J coupling nicely comes up. I'll give you this data and there is a way to for you to visualize this as well, which I'll share in the Google Classroom. Okay? So that's, a, that's where you have a spectrum. Let's try to take a look at the pulse program that we ended up using. So the pulse program that is being used is that you have a D1 delay. How much delay have I kept? I have kept about five seconds. That's why the integrals are working out nicely. You can do the experiment by cutting short the D1 and show that the integrals don't work out, which is what we learned in today's class. The T1 times are different, the integrals won't work out if you keep a shorter D1 in AQ. And the total acquisition time we said is 3.27 seconds. So basically you spent 5 plus 3.27 seconds, 8.27 seconds for the delay. And the pulse that you've applied is a four microsecond long pulse. And I know from the spectrometer, eight microseconds is a 90 degree. So four microseconds is about 45 degree pulse. Make sense? Yeah. So this is the example that I wanted to show to you today. And uh, what else do we have? So the same ethanol molecule, we will also be able to take a look at the carbon NMR spectrum. This is the proton NMR spectrum that I showed. The carbon NMR spectrum should show you how many signals? Just two signals. There's just two carbons in ethanol. Did I say methanol by mistake? Sorry. We have two signals, carbon signals in ethanol. Right? So that's one signal. This is the methylene. And... This is the methyl. Both come as singlets because we do something called decoupling. So let's take a quick look at the pulse program. Here yet again, you'll have a D1. Not sure how long it is. Yeah, so the D1 is about, there's a little more complicated stuff going on here. So D1 is about two seconds. And then your acquisition time will be much shorter and you end up applying something like a 30 degree pulse for carbon. So the recovery is faster and you end up getting things of the same kind. And here also you're able to immediately see, so if you end up doing the integration, it's not coming up, but let me try to do it quick. It actually came up reasonably well, but you are able to see that there is a 10% error that's being present. The methylene proton says one, at that time the methyl proton says is 1.08, which is about 8% error. It's largely because methyl protons are known to have a short T1 and therefore will recover faster to get a better sensitivity, which is why you should never integrate a carbon to get how many equivalents. This is a much larger tether. And let's stop right here because for the want of time, you can always ask questions like what is the D1 that is used? So if you hit D1 and enter, you will be able to get a value for it. It's a, being a little slow. Two seconds, if you hit AQ and enter, you will see what the acquisition time was, was about 1.1 second. And then the FID is something like this for carbon. Well, you'll probably be able to see nice frequencies if you zoom in. There are a combination of two frequencies that are there. And then you see that the signal starts to die quite a bit and you're already at the noise level. This is more or less how noise looks. Noise looks random and has an average of zero. Okay? The more the deviation from zero indicates more noise. So if you keep on acquiring, you can get more and more noise. Thank you.